Welcome to A Look Ahead. We are doing a regular uh, series, a Sabbath School series that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the second quarter of 2012. This series is entitled Witnessing and Evangelism, and this particular lesson is lesson number 10. It's the lesson for June 9 of 2012, entitled A Love Response. And we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, it seems like it's been a long delay in your coming. And sometimes we ask ourselves, what's the reason for that long delay? Could it be that we are not representing you correctly? Could it be that we're not witnessing as we should be? Could it be that our love response is less than it should be? We ask for you to guide us in our discussion of this question today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So the question is, what motivates us? Sometimes people are motivated by obligation. They feel like I know some people are very motivated by obligation. It's almost like they won't do something unless they think they just required to do it. Some people are motivated by guilt. Some people are motivated by shame. We as a church have ten commandments which we think we need to keep. And we're not going to argue about that right now, but why do you keep them? Well, when we read passages in the New Testament, it throws a new light on some of these things. For example, John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. So now, where does that take us? Does it mean that there's some people who keep the commandments because they love God, but there are other people who keep the commandments because they think they have to? Do we have any precedent for that? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. Do we have any precedents for that in the New Testament? Are there any, any people you can think of in the New Testament who kept a gazillion rules because they thought they had to? Pharisees and scribes. The Pharisees and the scribes. Very good. What do you think Jesus had in mind when he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments? Well, obviously, he wants, to, wants you to love him. <laughs> yeah, but, but it seems like he's asking you, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. I, th I think there's a broader implication behind this. You do it because you realize it's important, mm -hmm. and it's the only way that man can function without any of the problems that we've got on this earth. Yeah. Well, if you point. if you if you if you love the Lord, mm -hmm. is there any discipline required in keeping quotes keeping those commandments, or is it just happens? It just flows out, and so you. Well, I, I'm going to ask you a question that maybe you hadn't thought about. I'm sure when I talked about keeping the commandments, you all were think all were thinking about the Ten Commandments. What about some of the other commandments that Jesus gave, like, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Isn't that a command? Would that be one of the commandments of Jesus? Would that be a commandment of God? Well, you know, when you love someone, like if you love your husband, mm -hmm. you love to make his favorite dish. Mm -hmm. It makes you happy that he's happy, mm -hmm. or with your children. You love to give them a surprise or maybe <clears throat> something on their birthday because you just know that it's going to make them happy and when they're happy, you're happy. Okay. And to try to love God and, and serve God because that makes God happy and He wants you to be <clears throat> happy making Him happy. Very and good. so it's, but it's more difficult, I think, doing that for God because you know the people around you, but you have to learn who God is and, and come to think of Him uh, as you do the people you do love. There are, as you probably know, verses in the Bible, there's one in Luke, that says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one person who repents than over 99 just people or righteous people who don't need to repent. Now, that sounds like there are reasons for rejoicing in heaven sometimes. Right? 
Well, if you funny well, there, I, I didn't know there were ninety nine people out of every hundred that didn't need to repent. <laughs> I don't think it's talking about ninety nine out of every hundred need to repent. He's just saying, God, God is happy about the ninety nine, yeah. but I didn't he's know there was all, anybody that didn't need to repent. He's always happy to add one more. Okay. You know, we, talk, we talked about if you love Jesus, you will keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. we, didn't we skip another question? How do we love Jesus? Mm -hmm. How oh. do we love him? I don't know about... I mean, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I mean... Mm -hmm. well, that's what the text said. If you love me, what will you do? You'll keep the commandments. But what if you don't? Then, then you won't. You then, you, then you have to back up. There are other things that you need to do before. You get to that there, state. There's other things. Yes, you need to learn about Jesus, and you need to learn why. You need to learn the reasons why you should love Him. Yeah, but you're going to reasons now, and isn't love kind of an emotion? Well, the kind of love the Bible is talking about is is agape love. It's almost always in the New Testament agape love. That's a that's a, a Greek word, and that's a principle. It means you do it because it's the right thing to do. Well, that's interesting. You didn't say that at the beginning because no. you were talking about <laughs> love. Yeah. And love around here, around this this place, is like, you know, to different many, than that. To many modern human beings, love is an emotional issue. That's not what the New Testament means when it talks about love. Well, there is still an emotional element to it. Yeah, anything, sure. Anything that has value to it, mm -hmm. it doesn't... Has an emotional attachment. Yeah, that has some sort of emotional attachment to it. Uh, well, you, we better define this love thing again here. What do we? Yeah. I mean, Joanne was saying, well, if you love your husband, you're going to want to cook, you know, his favorite food. I'm, I'm okay. not sure that's always the case, but anyway. So, <laughs> what? 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 Define this agape love, maybe. Well, again. there are. I hear that word all yeah. the time, but there are four <clears throat> words used in the Greek of the New Testament that are sometimes translated love, and obviously. People have preached whole sermons on it, written whole books about it, so we're not going to cover the whole story. But just to give you a very, very brief idea, there is a thing called epithumia, which basically is talking about passion. It could even mean anger. It, it could mean various kinds of passion, but it's sometimes used for love. There's eros. Many people have, we have English words that are derived from that that mean erotic and so forth, which refers to a, mostly a sexual kind of love. There's philia, and many people are aware of the word Philadelphia, which comes from that philia word, or philos word, which means brotherly love, family love, the love that a person, the, the conjugal love that a person would feel for someone that you naturally, you know, a family member, a father, a mother, a child, a grandchild. Those are the normal human kinds of love, the philia kinds. Philadelphia means brotherly love, as, as I'm sure most of our audience are already aware of. But then there's agape love, and that's the one that the Bible, the New Testament, talks about the most. And agape love is a principled kind of love. It means you love someone even though they don't deserve it. You love it because by principle it's the right thing to do. You may love the guy who's drunk standing on the corner of the street not because there's anything attractive about that person at all, but because he is, or at least supposed to be, a child of God. That's the kind of love that would make you go through Gethsemane or yeah. hang on the cross. Exactly. It, it Some of you sound like a duty. Though. Mm. Is it a no. duty? No, no. Well, it sounded it, your your description sounded just like duty. Sounds like torture. <laughs> well, we're, we're gonna, I mean, we're how do you ask how do John you, the Baptist? How do you learn to love something, or how do you learn to love to do what's right? Don't well, that, we that's love a, to do what's wrong? That that's exact. That is a huge question. It's a very important question. It's a difference between being a Christian and being a follower of the devil. The devil's plan is selfishness and everything that goes with selfishness and doing what you feel like doing, all that kind of stuff. And Christians are, maybe that's why Jesus said, if you have love for one another, he's talking about the people within the church, if you have love for one another, everyone will know you're my disciples because it's so different from the behavior of the world. Maybe that's why. But how did that happen? Because they had spent three and a half years with Jesus. 
I haven't spent three and a half years. Well, with Jesus. you've got a Bible in front of you there. Start. Yeah, but it's all yeah. just text and ink. How well, is that going to do getting, anything? Getting back to your comment about the inebriated gentleman on the street mm -hmm. corner, you've got to realize, as the old saying says, there but for the grace of God go I. Yeah. And that's where you're getting into the God I, I love. I need to take us back to our outlines. So we can try to get our lesson covered, but thank you all for bringing up that point. <laughs> if you, as our members of our audience, uh, at some time would like to use some of the stuff we prepare for this peer, this class, you can find all our handouts on our website. It's called Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, it stands for Theological Crossroads, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and under the Sabbath School tab for the second quarter of 2012. And you're welcome to look there and join us in, in thinking through the challenges that we <coughs> obviously face as we <laughs> look at these lessons. Well, Ellen White had some very interesting things to say about motivation and about love. Um, this is one of the very provocative statements. The man who attempts, here, Gary, this is an answer to your question, the man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. In fact, he does not obey, okay? So if, 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 if you're keeping the commandments because you think you have to, and you don't enjoy it, you don't think it's the right thing to do, you're not obeying. Isn't that duty? Well, if you choose to call it duty, it's all right. You, no, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you yeah. or anything. I'm just wondering <clears throat> if it's really answering my question or not. Well, let me read on. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination. So here we have the natural selfishness that we're all born with in competition with the love that we hopefully are learning from Jesus Christ, from our Bibles, from the Scripture, from living a Christian life, then there's a problem. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness. The love of righteousness. You like to see right things happen. You like to see right things done. The love of the law of God. Because you believe that that law describes the kind of people who will be safe to take to heaven. The essence of all... Let me just finish. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, right because right doing is pleasing to God. When the creator of the universe and the one who stretched his arm, arms out on Calvary says, I'd like to have you do thus and so, wouldn't that sound a lot like duty that you'd love to do? Well, duty doesn't necessarily... Is there anything wrong with duty? Well, well it is if, if you're a Pharisee and you think it's your duty to do those, those laws. Ah, so there is, a, there is a, a way that you can interpret duty when you're trying to earn a salvation, you're trying to, to do it for that reason, to gain salvation by works. That's a duty that won't work. But a duty that I give to my, a relationship that I have with my God or with my wife, there are things that I must do, but I don't count it awful. It's a duty, but I love to do it. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, you don't. Cleaning out the Sorry for you. in an emergency because your <laughs> wife needs it done, or you may not. You like might it. even need it done, too. You might, well, you know, if you use that bathroom. <laughs> well, well, you know, there's, um, <laughs> there's no way that we can learn to love righteousness. It's not in us. The way we have to do is ask God to put the Holy Spirit into us to change us from the inside to like to do right. Because when you like to do wrong, you can think think yourself into a nervous breakdown trying to make yourself like to do right but mm -hmm. when you start praying to God put the Holy Spirit in me so I like to do right that's when you start to see yourself change and, and, and let me make a comment about that <clears throat> I had a professor and a pastor he was a professor for a while he was also a pastor for my, at my church for a while 
Pastor Paul Huback, and he said, there is no way to stamp out sin. The only thing you can do is crowd it out. And crowding it out means you look at the life of Jesus Christ every day and you say, I like what I see. I like what he did. I like the whole course of his thing. I would like to be like that. Instead of going to a bar, you go for a hike. Mm -hmm. And that way there's no time to go to the bar. Yeah. And you're too tired. And so you do things <laughs> like that <laughs> until yeah. you finally... Yes. No, this is true. And, and let me, well, let me emphasize... emphasize the <laughs> you can just get too no, tired no, that's, and do that's any that's kind of No, no, that's boring, <laughs> but you have to go do something <laughs> interesting that's good. Let me, let me talk about the, the, the legalist. We're talking about the Pharisees of the world, and unfortunately, it, there's still a lot of them around. And this, this quotation is found, originally was in the Signs of the Times, it's from Ellen White, July 22, 1897, and it has never been copied in any, it's in manuscript 20 of 1897, and it's in one of the manuscript releases, 12 manuscript releases, page 236.1, but nobody has access to those. But let me assure you, it's there. If you have the disc, it's on the disc from Ellen White. A sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop the character of a rebel. Not might, maybe, perhaps, it will. If you are obeying because you think you have to and you don't want to, you are a rebel and you will continue to be more and more so. That's the, the basic law of the way the human mind works. By such a one, service, that's loving the guy, the drunk standing on the corner, duty. or whatever duty, is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. If he dared, notice these words, these are God's words in my opinion from Ellen White, if he dared, such a one would disobey. He would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Now that's the contrast to the one we just read before that says we, we do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Okay, if you're just doing it because you think you have to, then this paragraph unfortunately applies to you. But here's the only thing you can do. Christ Object Lessons 159.3. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It's thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. That's all you can do. So then what you're saying is that <clears throat> if you're sullen, mm -hmm. um, there is a way, a way out of that sullenness. Yep. You can, you can, you really don't want to change these diapers, and you hate to change diapers, but there can be a change in you so that... When you fall in love <coughs> with the diaper soiler, mm -hmm. <laughs> changing the diaper becomes something that you tolerate gladly. An act of love. Uh -huh. You know, I think... I think, though, that the spark that starts love for God is a mysterious thing for everybody. That's my personal opinion. I don't think there's, there's any kind of equation you can come up with to, to explain how it starts. It just does. Here, I, I, I will tell you the way it happens in Christians. I, I can't, I, I mean, I'm not trying to deal with all of sociology, or all of in, human interaction. But this is, this is the, the, the description from Ellen White, once again, Great Controversy, page 555. It is a law. Now that means it happens, okay? Both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. Remember I said, we, if we spend our time looking at the life of Jesus and we, we think about what he did and we try to comprehend it, we, even all of Scripture, we look what's going on there, we say, God, why did you do this here? Why did you do that? We try to focus on that kind of stuff. 
it will change us, especially if we want to be changed. And that's where the magic yeah. that Jer Gary's talking about takes yeah, place. Where does that start at? Because you have to start wanting to look at his life. So what's well, going to make you go there first? Is it going to be another had... loved one's going to say, hey, try this Jesus out yeah. and stuff? It's, it reminds me of a of a real estate guy coming in. Oh, you're going to love this house. Come in here and look at it. Look at it. And you, it's a wonderful house. But then you come out and you say, if you know, I don't like it. If you're, so. fortunate <laughs> enough, if you're fortunate enough, you will have parents that taught you to love from the beginning. Well, coming in as a non-Christian, I think it was seeing people that were different and that were attractive. And how, how can they handle this and this and this and still be a kind person? It's like, what, do, what, it, what is going on here? Well, I think the very, very beginning, even before what you read there, is is mysterious to me. I don't know what mm -hmm. it is. Okay. But well, and, and some people would say that there's a Jesus-shaped hole in everyone's heart. Everyone has a need for something. We may chase all kinds of stuff, thinking, "Well, this will make us happy." That I mean, we all know stories of movie stars and other people like that. They're just constantly pursuing this or that or the other. And if you want to go back into history, I mean, look at, look at Ecclesiastes. Solomon tried everything under the sun that money could buy him uh, to try to make himself happy when he was running away from God. So uh, coming back to our, our lesson, what should be the correct motivation for witnessing? Did the disciples love Christ so much that they could not keep quiet about it? And they loved other people, too. Yes. Could that be true of us in our day? And how would you know whether it was a true love response? Desire of Ages 339. Mm -hmm. It is in working to spread the good news of salvation that we are brought near to the Savior. Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Well, long-term commitments are hard to maintain. They require a high degree of motivation. Perhaps the best examples we could give in, in modern times are parents' commitment to the success of their children. Do they, they care for them, they feed them, they clothe them, they house them, they give them weddings. Some of our group have just done that. Uh, they educate them at great expense. Why do they do that? Is it because they think they have to or because they really love their children? They want them to be a successful human being on a solid foundation yeah. because the world is going to come and try to knock Okay, them now, do we really love God? Or are we just hoping to get eternal life from Him? How does it make you feel to know that God loved you first? Even when you were a sinner, you, you know the Romans 5 that talks about that's that first spark. Yeah. Well, that you were talking yeah. about the here, magic. Here's, if we're just looking for the goodies of, of heaven, then uh, there's something wrong. Okay. You know, that that isn't love. That isn't the the motivation we that will work. Look at these verses from First John chapter four, verse eighteen and nineteen. There is no fear in love. How many people in our world are living in fear? There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid because fear has to do with punishment. We love because God first loved us. Now, where so, does that fit as far as... Uh, there was this girl I wanted to ask out, but I was scared to death. <laughs> okay, well, I don't think there that's the no kind of love, love God's there. talking about. <laughs> no. Yeah, but I didn't... Uh, that's not agape love. <laughs> not, yeah, well, it kind of was. I don't think I wanted to marry her or anything. You know, eternal life is so far away and so abstract hmm. that you really love God because he helps you live in this world. And eternal life, to me, it's like hard to hmm. imagine. So, How many people are afraid of God? Oh, the preachers tell you, look out. Mm -hmm. Well, every time he appears to a human, they fall on their nose. Yeah, even in the Bible, huh? yeah. his, his friends. Right. Would it be possible to love God? Here's, here's the real question, I guess. Would it be possible to love God if you didn't know him? Or know anything about him? No. 
I don't think it's possible to love anything that you don't know anything about. Okay. But I think you can love something that, uh, like nature, and yeah. not realize that God is the creator. And when you are introduced then to God, you can go. But the more you know about nature, the more you love it. There was a classic, yeah. classic that today after went to the gym class, and a lady was uh, walking out with me, and she walked on the grass, and I was on the sidewalk, and I says, "Why are you walking on the grass?" And she says, "I want to be close to the earth," and I thought. She wants to be close to God and doesn't know it because that is the Creator. Did she have her shoes off? No, she had her shoes on, but she, she wanted could have got to closer, walk. Couldn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I is um, it cement from the earth? I think. I, <laughs> I remember a cartoon of way back when I was in college. It shows this guy. He has fixed his house all nice, and he's planted new grass out there, big in front of his house. And it was a, it's a corner lot, so people were trying to, you know, had been walking across there. Please do not walk on the grass. And uh, so next the next scene, you see him mowing away and mowing away. And the next scene, he's mowing away and he's sweating. It's getting warmer in the middle of the summer, and he's mowing and mowing. And finally, the sign he crashes out the do not says, please walk on the grass. <laughs> Just somehow or other that came to my mind. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> <put out>. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, well, I think it's interesting uh, getting back to some of Christ's sayings. It was love God and love your neighbor as mm -hmm. yourself. If you read w further down what you just read, uh, he has seen, no, he, the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen mm -hmm. cannot love God whom he has not seen. That's right. kind of clarifies it right and there. And you know, John, you, you wonder if he knew anything about sibling rivalry. <laughs> I know a lady who has a brother and like he's stolen her social security number and trying oh, wow. to do all sorts of illegal stuff. Now, you know, there are some times that you have a hard time. Maybe she knows it's her brother, but he's just made her life terrible, and so yeah. that. Why did why did the author of the Sabbath School lesson feel that it was important to put this in the in the Sabbath School lesson? Boy, I can't I can't read somebody else's mind. I'm sorry. Um, I think I think it's a challenge to us. I think there's an awful lot of Seventh-day Adventists, and I'm one of those. I've been since, I mean, I'm a fourth-generation Adventist. But I think there's an awful lot of us who are real comfortable where we are, and we, it's, it takes quite a bit of doing to get us to move. And, and maybe that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. To get you to move where? To get into, go into action, to do anything in terms of witnessing, in terms of whatever we just... Sabbath morning church and Sabbath school and maybe a few other one or two other meetings a week that's our that's our club we attend the club and it's yeah. and you have your friends all week yeah. long that are and God forbid that we have any friends that are not Adventists you know well where there's no active labor for others that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. love wanes and faith grows dim I, you know, that's a lot of work to take, do all this evangelism stuff. Cry me a river. Already pretty, <laughs> already pretty busy with stuff. Yeah, and I mean, aren't I being, uh, aren't I being a missionary at my work? I mean, that takes up well, a lot of could, my time, and yeah, I, yes. and so forth. And isn't that being evangelism? I, so, I guess you, you better tell us: Are you being a missionary at your work? Because that's one of the lessons we had a few few weeks back. Well, <laughs> well. <laughs> sometimes I think I. Well, I think in your line of your your profession, you're doing it without even thinking quite often. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, and that's one of the things I I like about my profession is that I'm really heavily immersed in this kind of a thing. But right. you know, what if I go lay concrete? Well, you know, all day, you know, mm -hmm. and I see the same five guys, and uh, is that the kind of evangelism we're talking about here? Or, I mean, well, that's a part of evangelism, but we, then we, when I think about going out and really evangelizing, you know, giving Bible studies, and mm -hmm. eh, that's a lot of work, and then if you get somebody that's kind of interested, then you've got to 
drag them to Sabbath school, and you just as soon go yourself. Oh, I would have to hunt, take pick Sounds these like people a, up, and all that. That's this, all on this, duty this, to this, me. This <laughs> coming weekend, no, this coming weekend we have the ASI meeting here, uh, the Southern California, and that's people who are in the work world and who are using uh, whatever means they have in matching their particular company to um, spread out just bits and pieces of the gospel. So and, and it's so, very important. So let, let's, let's start being really clear about the Christian life. Do we do what we do because we think we have to? Do we read scripture, for example, as a code book of deeds to be done and sins to be shunned? Or do we read scripture as a revelation of the truth about God and having understood at least some of that truth about God, do we say, I like that. I, will, I remind you about the story of the very elderly lady was in a uh, extended care facility and Dr. Maxwell, my mentor, had a series of meetings there for these people and they went all the way through the Bible. It took more than a year. All the way through the Bible, book by book, and this lady got up at the end of that uh, revelation and he, he was asking, you know, well, what did you think? any feedback and and she got up and she said you know she says I have been a Christian all my life and I have been taught from day one that I was supposed to love God but she says now that I've seen him in this particular setting and looking at the whole Bible through and realizing what going on behind the scenes she says now I like him mm -hmm. and that's what we're talking about if God is a good friend and you like what you see when you read scripture and if you understand what's going on behind the scenes and you, you look forward to the chance, and this, is, this isn't the major part of the motivation, I don't think, but if you look forward to the time when you might actually live with him forever, then I think the disciples in biblical times, they could not keep quiet about their faith. They could not. They, Everybody they saw, they wanted to tell them about Jesus. And I think we're real short of those kind of people today. Well, you know, it depends a lot how you study the Bible, like studying a topic, studying with your lesson sheets, mm -hmm. plug, plug, um, really helps. But like those Bible reading guides where you read two verses over here, three verses over here, and then one verse over here, and you go through the Bible in a year, it's you haven't learned a thing. You just, you, you, I think, yeah. I, it, everything is disjointed. And so when you study disjointed, uh, nothing makes sense. Well, let's think about the devil's motivation for just a moment. Down to what we call the Dark Ages. He made the church so oppressive, basically in, in Western Europe, that, I mean, everybody was trying to figure out how to get out from under this oppression. The, the church demanded submission even from kings. Now in more modern times, the church has tried to motivate its members by guilt, etc. Um, and and, and, and I, I think, I, I don't think that's going to work either. Uh, maybe your pastor in your church has said, please everybody get out, we need to do this, we need to do that, da, da, da. You know, we, we owe this to the Lord or we ought to do this and so forth. Well, I don't, I don't think that's the real motivation. I think the people who are going to get out there and make a difference are the ones who have sat down with their Bible enough so they've gotten to know God and they said, that's, that's my friend. I want to be more like him. I had an experience. My nephew, uh, he's, he's wanting to go to these churches uh, to see if there's any single groups. And he goes to a conservative church that has an organ and stuff, and so he's used to that. But he started going to these mega churches, and he says, why do they put you in a dark room with a video, uh, whatever? He says, I can't stand it in there. It, he, he doesn't like the flashing lights and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. It gives him a headache. And so why are churches, when God creates light and, and uh, the outdoors, are they putting you in a dark room with a blaring speaker system and um, some people just don't go with that and then he's going what is going on I'm so glad he's oh running out of time I'm so glad he's grounded in a um, conservative church yeah. that has light 
um, mm -hmm. and doesn't turn off the lights, you know, anyway. Well, <coughs> in, in, terms of, in terms of reasons why we might love God, one of the motivations that, that has traditionally been really emphasized by pastors is Jesus will deal with your sins. Just bring those sins to Jesus and you can hand them to him and he'll take care of them. And Martin Luther was so obsessed with his past sins, and I don't know what his life was before he became, uh, you know, the, the ultimate reformer that he was, but he was so obsessed with dealing with those past sins, and I, it probably has more to do with his Catholic background. Was that he, he an just, alcoholic? No. No? No. He liked beer. Yeah, he... I, I heard he was. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't think he was. It didn't make him stuff. alcoholic, but no. he, he used to, in his letters, he used yeah. to write how he Such enjoyed it. to drink back then. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Does so... Does the concept of forgiveness have any? What about to that? With, with, with do, we, do we love God because he, we, he forgives us? There is something to, and I, I don't know where it's going, but I, uh, knowing that someone's going to love you regardless. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and, and it doesn't mean I can go out and do whatever I want because they're going to love me anyway. Yeah. It's if I fall. Yeah. Well, and think about how many people, instead of looking at God as someone who, who loves them no matter what, look at God as the guy with the big stick. He yeah. says, boy, if you, if, you, if you got one sin on your record that you for, forgot to ask confession for, you know. Peter was the one who experienced what you were just talking about. He just denied his Lord for the third time, the cock crowed, and he looked at Jesus, and mm. Jesus looked at him, and there was no anger, no nothing, but that look of love broke Peter's heart, and he went out and cried like a baby, fell on the spot where Jesus had been. He was a changed man yeah. from that point on. Yeah. I think Just people are different. I mean, you look at your brothers and your sisters, and mm. I, I was the one that if my parents looked at me funny, I went, okay, I'll do whatever, where my sister was, okay, let's see <laughs> if we can do it another way, <laughs> you know. A uh, true rebel, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think we can't put everybody into a mold and mm -hmm. say, you have to do it this way. No, no, no. But one thing we can say about everybody, and that's we're all sinners. The good news is not about us. The good news is about God. Yes. And we need to keep saying that. We need to keep saying that as often as we can. Um, and we need to be saying things like selfishness is the, is the guiding principle in Satan's kingdom. And it's natural for us as human beings to be as selfish as we can be. But love is a pr guiding principle in God's kingdom. And if we have an idea that we'd rather live with God than with, with Satan, then we need to start cultivating and practicing that love principle. It's not easy, and, and, and it doesn't come inherently to human beings. Does God, does God love me because of the agape love? Or is it agape well, love? Well, that's, that that's a description of, of, of God's love for me, but uh, it's, not because, it's not because God thinks he has to. He loves you, and if you want to describe that love, we can call it agape love. It's the right thing to do. But he, he doesn't love you because he thinks he has to to have agape love. Okay. Is sin an incurable disease and Jesus is the antibiotic that we all need to take in order to survive well, this? Here, here's the biblical passage to answer your question, at least as far as possible. It's, it's found in Romans 5, starting with verse 6. For when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. So, I don't know. I mean, that ought to, that ought to help at least a little bit. However, it's the the plan is bigger and broader than that. Surely we would agree that the greatest love a person could show for another person is to die for them. Um, Jesus said that, John 15, 13. But there are other reasons why Jesus did what he did. And I would like to read you this. This is found in 
uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, paragraph 2. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God um, before the universe. That's the entire universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Not all men, just no, all. No, just all. The, the, the word men in the King James Version and a lot of other versions is supplied. It's not there. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to human beings, men and women, but before all the universe, it would justify God and His Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Now this is, this is, um, Adventists would say, this is a rather unique understanding <clears throat> about, about God. Yes. And is this what we, I don't think in general, I don't think Baptists generally think this way. I don't no. think Methodists. Now, I'm no. not, I think there may be some. Mm -hmm. but, but, so is this <clears throat> what we mean when we, when we talk about, when we use the term the great controversy? Yes. Is, this, is, this really, uh, um, is this really the th what, what we might describe as, as the message of the Adventist church? Not necessarily this the 2300 yeah. days or the Sabbath. Or, or although those are, you know, those are all components, but Therefore, is this really the message that... The, the, the basic core, this is the basic core teaching of Ellen White's five, you know, all-encompassing books, the Conflict of the Ages series. And this is what that's all about, and this is what Adventists ought to be focusing on. We have a bigger, broader, larger, wider, deeper, understanding of the plan of salvation than our Christian friends, and we need to tell them about it. Well, you know, the Bible says all, and it doesn't say all men. No. But churches have difficulty with all, and so they insert the word men. So if you take the Bible, just what the original says, mm -hmm. and then try to figure out why does it say all and not all men. So when I'm, when I'm sitting on the airplane and my seatmate sees a logo on my, the name of my institution on yeah. my, on my, uh, th the tag on my, on my bag there okay. or something like that. And they see it's Seventh-day Adventists and they ask you, well, what is it that Seventh-day Adventists believe? Um, Ten words. Is it, is it my inclination most of the time to, well, you know, it's the Seventh-day Sabbath and we, are largely vegetarians and we have this health message or, or, or is it really this great controversy theme? This should be, the great controversy theme should be what it's all about. It really should be. And that, that's, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, when Adam and Eve sinned, the communion with God that they had had up to that time was cut off. And there was no way that they could ever communicate with God again. They were well, permanently in, in cut off in person. In seeing Him. Yeah, they could, they, that, hum, that human divine connection was broken. Jesus, who was divine, took on humanity. Now you have humanity and divinity combined again. And he showed that humanity could, could obey God, could love, and did. And so now by that mechanism, he can reach down and grab us and hook us with divinity. And what Adam lost can be put back together. If that doesn't drive us into some kind of thankfulness, of gratitude, I don't know what will. Well, but... 
I'll, I'll use modern science, although it's it's more than modern thought. Yeah, that's lost. Yes, modern thought. The devil is taking us away <clears throat> from thinking like God as fast as he possibly can. The fact that we have any any original relationship to God that's been separated and that we're different and and now and and mm. we need some kind of a link to bring us back it's that, that concept is just gone maybe, well maybe we should talk about it yeah um, I've already mentioned our website but for those of you who are wondering what this is all about maybe it seems a little strange to you, you haven't heard it like this before May I suggest that you go once again to our website, theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Look for other authors there, Ellen White, and look at the handout entitled, The Plan of Salvation, The Setting of the Great Controversy. It's, a, it's an eye-opener, and it's quotations from Ellen White about these things we've been talking about. And I, we don't have time to go into that in more detail right now, but I certainly would encourage any of you who have not looked at this approach to do so. Many Christians down through the generations have fallen into the trap of legalism. They believe that they must do many things. They must, they must work on earning their salvation. They're not comfortable receiving something they don't deserve. Others believing that they need to do all of those things realize that they are not able to and become discouraged. So how do we respond to this these two groups, the discouraged ones and the, the, the stubborn Dutchman from South Dakota, as one of my pastors used to say, who says, oh, I will do this if it kills me. How do we respond to those people? <laughs> Lord, take my heart. I cannot <laughs> yeah. do it. Okay. So the, the problem is that um, people are trying to figure out how they can they do their part Mm -hmm. and their their part is very important um, so um, I'm trying to see what the the real question is here mm -hmm. as far as that goes well we're, we're talking about Jesus said if you love me keep my commandments mm -hmm. usually people approach that to say that's referring to the Ten Commandments we're talking about other things like witnessing and so forth that we are also considered to be part of Christ's commandments. And generally there, there, there are large groups of people anyway who have had one of two responses to that. One group is pedaling as fast as they can. They're doing everything they can. They're working and, and they don't even want to admit how many times they fail to keep the commandments, but boy, they're working on it. And there's another group who try for a while and then they say, you know, I don't care how long I work at this, I'm not going to make it. And they get discouraged, and those people, a lot of them, just drop out of the church. They say, whatever God's requirements are just more than I'm capable of. And the question is, how do we approach those two groups, big groups of people? Well, you've got to point to God. Yeah. I well, mean, this is what Paul said, Romans 10. My brothers and sisters, how I wish with all my heart that my own people might be saved. How I pray to God for them. I can assure you that, I mean, Paul is feeling the same kind of thing we're talking about. I can assure you that they are deeply devoted to God. They're trying hard, but their devotion is not based on true knowledge. They have not known the way in which God puts people right with himself, and instead, they have tried to set up their own way. And so they did not submit themselves to God's way or put, of putting people right. For Christ has brought the law to an end, so that everyone who believes is put right with God. And I can tell you that Phillips, for example, a pastor who translated the New Testament and part of the Old Testament said, he's not talking about God's gotten rid of the law. It says he's talking about God has put to an end, has put to an end the idea that we can somehow earn salvation by keeping the law. And, and that's one of the groups we were just talking about. Well, we're, we're running out of time. We need to keep moving on. How should we relate to people who actually believe they're living up to all God's requirements? Tell them, very good, very good. <laughs> but you're not. 
Remember the story of the rich young ruler in the Bible? And I'm sure Paul would have been right, standing right beside this, or Saul, as he was called in those days, back in the days when he was still in Jerusalem, he was still a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And this young rich, rich young ruler came and he saw Jesus blessing the children. He saw them him, him just exuding love, if you will. And he said, man, I want some of that. Gary, here's your question. I want some of that. This man was attracted. But the, the spark happened there. Yes. Why did it happen to him and not somebody else? I think it happened to a lot of people. I know, but some people it didn't, though. Yeah, yeah. So explain and that. of then. course, you know what, Jesus, he, he, he came up to Jesus. Um, he came to Jesus and he said, Teacher, yes, what good thing must I do to receive eternal life? You know, I, I'm obeying 659 rules right now. Give me another one and I'll be, I'll be home free. Why do you ask me what is concerning what is good? Answered Jesus, there is only one who is good. Keep the commandments if you want to enter life. What commandments, he asked. Jesus answered, do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Here's the Ten Commandments being mentioned. Do not steal. Do not abuse anyone false, accuse anyone falsely. Respect your father and your mother. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that was one of the commands that didn't make it into the Ten Commandments. I have obeyed all these commandments. The young man replied, what else do I need to do? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, <clears throat> and you will have riches in heaven, then come and follow me. And what was the response? Turned away sorrowful. He turned away very sad. <clears throat> Whatever I, love he, he scraped up right there wasn't enough, <laughs> it looks like. Now, is Jesus telling us to give all our money away to the poor? No, what the problem was that this, this young man already had his God. And, and that was his money. And we need to understand that to the Jewish people in Jesus' day, if God was if you were doing good things, God would bless you, and if God blessed you, you would be rich. So you could tell who the good people were, they were the rich people. And Jesus said, Sell everything you have, and the man says, Hold on, what in the world are you saying? You're saying, I'm giving up all the evidence that I'm a good person. You want me to look like a bad person, and I can follow you? That, that's asking too much. That's just asking too much. Don't you think that the root of the whole thing is that he liked his money? Well, of course. I wasn't not, not necessarily because it made him look like he was a, a, a God-blessed person. Oh, well, that was that was pretty pretty clear in his mind as well. He liked himself. He was trying to get him to change his priorities. Mm -hmm. He knew very well. He was drawing a comparison. He knew the young fellow would size this up. Well, there's a there's a conundrum in the Bible. The, the Bible talks in a number of places about being slaves to sin. And then it talks about getting out of that slavery and joining the cause of Christ. And Paul says in several places, and James said it, and Peter said it, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. Does that mean that we are all slaves? We're either slaves of sin or we're slaves of Jesus? Is there no way to get out of this slavery? No. 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 <laughs> well, slavery doesn't sound like fun. Did he actually use the word slave? I'm a slave yes. to Jesus Christ? Yes. Well, a slave is kind of the ultimate commitment, isn't it? Look Whether it's forced or, or given by whatever. Um, from, here's an example, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, from Paul and Timothy, servants. You know, we're, we, we, there's so much problems connected to the word slaves we don't like to use it anymore, but the word in Greek is slaves. Slaves of Christ Jesus to all God's people in Philippi, etc. And there's lots of other places where, where Paul calls himself. If you see a, the word servant, describe, Paul describing himself as a servant, you can bet that the word is, is slave. But what do you mean by slave? That's well, that's what I was trying to ask you. you mean by I think, I, I, I'll tell you what I think Paul meant, because we're running out of time. I am absolutely convinced that Paul was so... He had the, the love of God, the love of Jesus, and the commitment of the gospel so burning in his heart that he couldn't keep quiet about it. He, he, he was controlled by that passion to spread the gospel. Yeah, I see that. Couldn't separate himself. No, 
I could I see not. that, but th when I look at a slave, when I see one on television, I see somebody being beat down with a whip. Well, and that Paul kind says of thing. he was whipped lots of times. He was beaten within a breath Yeah, but of did God do that? Well, it doesn't, not a question of who did it. Well, that's what I think. Your master beats you. That's when you say, when well, you say slave. That's, that's not what Paul is talking about. You're also I know it isn't what he's talking also, about. It's just that when you yeah. use the word slave, well, you that's know, why, these things come up. That's why, they, that's why they, don't, they use the word servant instead of slave. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we need to be honest with, with what it actually says. Jay. Uh, let's see, where was my thought? <laughs> oh, well, you know, we're slaves to food. Yeah. We're slaves to water. We're sla certainly slaves to, to oxygen and air. In the case of Paul, however, it was, it was a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of choice. I can't, well, I guess I can choose not to breathe, but mm -hmm. the commitment is so strong <coughs> and so developed that it, it runs the life just like a, like a slave master beats his servant into, into doing what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. the, it's not a beating, but the commitment is that strong that the results, the actions, act like that. Uh, well, good. In, in the last few seconds, really, that we have, let me read one more quotation from Ellen White. This is Acts of the Apostles, page 261. The watchful Christian is a working Christian, seeking zealously to do all in his power for the advancement of the gospel. As love for his Redeemer increases, so also does love for his fellow men. He has severe trials, as had his master, but he does not allow affliction to sour his temper or destroy his peace of mind. He knows that trial, if well borne, will refine and purify him. Remember that in the, 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 the three angels' messages, verse 12 down there, the endurance of the saints, okay? He knows that trial of well-born will refine and purify him and bring him into closer fellowship with, Je with Christ. Those who are partakers of Christ's sufferings will also be partakers of his consolation and at last sharers of his glory. So there's a, a lot, you know, we need to experience the love of Christ and then we need to be committed to it, and we need to respond to it. And that response means sharing with others, showing the love that's been shown to us. And I don't know how to describe it in any other words, but I hope that you have fun describing this in your class when you discuss it. See you next week.